There are no really effective anti-aging medicines or pharmaceuticals available right now. The only things that really exist are things that may be of some benefit to people who are unusually susceptible to particular aspects of aging. People who, for example, might be coming down with type 2 diabetes in their, in their 30s or who might get heart disease in their 30s. That's unusually young, and if you are genetically susceptible so that that might happen to you, then there are things that you can do that might stave that off and bring you closer to having an average age of onset of those problems and therefore an average lifespan. Um, but for people who have already by default got an average lifespan, let's say they're not going to die until the age of 80 or so, whatever happens unless they get hit by a truck, then um, there really is nothing that can appreciably extend their life. There are some misunderstandings in the popular press about the extent to which one's genetics affects one's longevity. Uh, and this is really because the comparisons that scientists make to put numbers on the importance of genes for longevity are not always well explained. So if we compare different human beings, then the typical number that people get is that about 25% of the difference between different people's longevity is explained by their genes. But in reality, virtually all of our longevity is determined by our genes because it also explains the difference between our lifespan and the lifespan of mice or fruit flies or whatever. Ultimately, the reason they don't live so long is because they have different genes that have caused them to have a different body that ages less well and therefore ages more rapidly. At the moment, we have in the industrialized world an average lifespan that's something, something around twice what it was 100 or 120 years ago, which is a pretty respectable increase. And that's happened in two stages. In the first stage from, let's say, 100 years ago until 50 years ago, um, most of the increase in average lifespan was due to very much fewer people dying in early life, especially in infancy. So, if, of course, if you measure average lifespan, what you're doing is you're including people who die at age zero. And there were an awful lot of people dying at age zero 100 or 150 years ago, and there are hardly any now in the industrialized world. But in the second phase, let's say in the past 50 years, that problem had already been solved, so we couldn't have any additional gain to speak of in our life expectancy. But life expectancy has carried on going up, and therefore it's done so by slowing down the rate at which people die at older ages. Now the reason for that is a good deal less clear than the reason for the decline in infant mortality that happened first. Of course, the infant mortality just declined because we started to understand things like hygiene and antibiotics and vaccines. Um, what's happened in the more recent period, we really don't absolutely know what's going on. There are various factors that could be involved, like for example, um, the fact that people don't smoke quite so much. Um, there are various interesting factors to do with prenatal life, in other words, to do with how well um, the baby was actually fed through the bloodstream of the mother when, um, before birth. There seems to be a good deal of um, correlation there, but these are still open questions. Aging kills people, and by and large, it kills people really, really horribly. Furthermore, it kills an unbelievable number of people, roughly 100,000 people a day worldwide. Over, overall in the world, roughly 150,000 people die each day, and about two-thirds of them die of age-related causes, of causes that young people more or less never die of. In the industrialized world, it's more like 90% of people that die of age-related causes. And as I say, most of them die really horribly. Aging is very bad for you. Now, that means that it's really bizarre that one should actually ask the question, why should we defy aging? Because we all know that we should defy cancer and atherosclerosis and Alzheimer's and diabetes and so on. And there's no argument about it. People appreciate that these things are bad ideas, bad things, and it's our medical and social duty and humanitarian duty to put serious effort into developing effective ways to defeat these problems. Now, aging is simply the sum of all of those things, plus a few things that we don't call diseases, like, for example, decline of immune function and loss of muscle mass and gain of fat mass. But still, the same applies. It's just the sum of all of these aspects of aging that we already don't like. It's unclear whether we will completely have 
brought aging under control in 50 years, but I think that if we get good funding, especially for the early work that needs to be done on mice in the next 10 years, then there's a very good chance that we will be there. And if we can describe that as eternal use, I suppose the only problem is with the word eternal, because it sort of implies that we won't even be hit by trucks and so on. But certainly we will be able, once we reach that point, to fend off the decline in health and vigor and vitality that currently accompanies aging. We will always have the possibility of dying from old age, even when these therapies exist, just as today we have the possibility of dying of polio or tuberculosis. But we will not have the necessity to die of old age because these therapies will be able to postpone the accumulating molecular and cellular damage of aging indefinitely, just in the same way that classic cars do not actually die at all. They don't have a mortality rate. The only time a classic car dies, so to speak, is when its owners stop looking after it. The role of the government in working on combating aging has so far been very slight. And I think this is no surprise, because at the moment there is, of course, still a great deal of ambivalence in society with regard to whether defeating aging or even combating aging would be a good thing. People, on the one hand, know how horrible aging is, but on the other hand, they have had to live with it for so many millennia um, through the whole of civilization that we've come to have a, a degree of irrationality about aging. And so it's not obvious that there are really any votes in combating aging at the moment, in spending taxpayers' money on it. And for that reason, it's pretty tricky to get government to put serious money into it. At the moment, there are not nearly enough organizations out there supporting work to actually combat aging. The foundation that I run, the Methuselah Foundation, of which I'm the chairman and the chief science officer, is probably the main one that's really focusing on the development of future therapies that will really combat aging. There are, of course, plenty of studies going on around the world which are more indirectly focused on the eventual hopeful development of anti-aging um, therapies. Essentially, all work within biogerontology, within the study of understanding aging, is with an eventual hope that that understanding will lead us to be able to develop future therapies. But that's a much more indirect approach than the approach that the Methuselah Foundation is taking. Then, of course, there are people who sell existing products that really don't work very well at all yet and who are interested in improving the efficacy of those products by finding better ways to do things. So there are some companies, for example, trying to find analogues of resveratrol that work much better than resveratrol, and some people think that those things might be effective against human aging. Remove as many factors that can endanger the lives of human beings, focusing on individual health and then dealing with aging. In a system like the monetary system, neither a solution for aging can't help the species because it will have a price, and those who will have access to it will be those with power in this society. Because there's a society based on profit, also, this solution will become a business. It's sad but true, and do not forget that almost all the researches in this field are limited by the system itself, who is based on budgets. A progressive society, based on the evolution of the human race, would focus on education on human beings' information, a society where people would recognize themselves as equals in a society that must rely on planet resources and goods and services abundance, such a society could create intelligent members and the main occupation could be focusing on solving the aging problem or educating human beings on the most important aspect of their existence. It's amazing how, for a species considered to be intelligent, its members don't face the main problem within species, death. 
not only that they don't focus on the most important aspect within species, but the majority not even realize it. And then, why is considered an intelligent species?